Hello and welcome to Lecture 11, Levers and Mechanical Advantage. In this lecture, we're going to discuss levers and explain what levers are. We're going to discuss the three different classes of levers. We'll look at some levers that are in the human body. We'll discuss mechanical advantage and then we'll do some practice problems. So what exactly is a lever? Let's watch the short video to find out. A famous ancient Greek once said, Give me a place to stand, and I shall move the earth. But this wasn't some wizard claiming to perform impossible feats. It was the mathematician Archimedes describing the fundamental principle behind the lever. The idea of a person moving such a huge mass on their own might sound like magic, but chances are you've seen it in your everyday life. One of the best examples is something you might recognize from a childhood playground a teeter-totter, or seesaw. Let's say you and a friend decide to hop on. If you both weigh about the same, you can totter back and forth pretty easily. But what happens if your friend weighs more? Suddenly, you're stuck up in the air. Fortunately, you probably know what to do. Just move back on the seesaw, and down you go. This may seem simple and intuitive, but what you're actually doing is using a lever to lift a weight that would otherwise be too heavy. Every lever consists of three main components, the effort arm, the resistance arm, and the fulcrum. In this case, your weight is the effort force, while your friend's weight provides the resistance force. What Archimedes learned was that there is an important relationship between the magnitudes of these forces and their distances from the fulcrum. The lever is balanced when the product of the effort force and the length of the effort arm equals the product of the resistance force and the length of the resistance arm. So if your friend weighs twice as much as you, you'd need to sit twice as far from the center as him in order to lift him. By the same token, his little sister, whose weight is only a quarter of yours, could lift you by sitting four times as far as you. Seesaws may be fun, but the implications and possible uses of levers get much more impressive than that. With a big enough lever, you can lift some pretty heavy things. A person weighing 150 pounds, or 68 kilograms, could use a lever just 3.7 meters long to balance a smart car, or a 10 meter lever to lift a 2.5 ton stone block, like the ones used to build the pyramids. If you wanted to lift the Eiffel Tower, your lever would have to be a bit longer, about 40.6 kilometers. And what about Archimedes' famous boast? Sure, it's hypothetically possible. The Earth weighs 6 times 10 to the 24th power kilograms, and the Moon, that's about 384,400 kilometers away, would make a great fulcrum. So all you'd need to lift the Earth is a lever with a length of about a quadrillion light years, one and a half billion times the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, and of course, a place to stand so you can use it. So for such a simple machine, the lever is capable of some pretty amazing things. All right, so to just go over some of the things that you saw in that video, a lever consists of four parts, the lever arm, a rigid bar or rod. So let's just draw what that would look like. So we've got basically, if we think of the seesaw, this is like the wooden part that you would be sitting on. Okay, so that's the lever arm. The fulcrum, so that's the uh, support point where the lever pivots. So again, if this was a seesaw, it would be the point in the middle, though the fulcrum's not always in the middle, and we'll look at that later. The load, so the load is what you're trying to lift. So let's say there's um, a person on the other side, or maybe it's a big block and you're trying to lift it, that's the load. And then the effort is the ap applied force. So this is the force that you're using to lift the load. So in that case, this would be you let's say, and you have a force pushing down here. This is the effort force, so I'll just write the word effort here. This is the load over here, so I'll call that load. This is the fulcrum. And then this whole thing here 
is the lever arm. All right, so there are three different classes or types of levers um, according to where the load and the effort are located with respect to the fulcrum. Okay, so I made up this word flex to help us remember which type is which. So if I just write out the words that correspond to each of these letters, I have F, F for fulcrum, L for load, and E for effort. X doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I just needed it to make it into a word. <laughs> okay, so what does this mean? When the fulcrum is in the middle, so between the load and the effort, then that makes this a first class lever. When the load is in the middle, so that means the load is between the fulcrum and the effort, that makes this a second class lever. And when the effort is in the middle, so the effort is between the fulcrum and the load, that makes this a third class lever. Okay, so we're going to use these three definitions to decide which class lever is which. So we're going to take a look at the first one. Well, this is a first class lever. Let's take a look at this. So if we try to um, identify where the fulcrum is, the load, and the effort, let's do that. So the fulcrum is the pivot point. That's the point where the whole um, arm is, the lever arm is rotating about. So that would be right here. Okay, so this over here is the fulcrum. The load is the weight that you're trying to carry. So that's this big, huge stone here. So this is your load, it's pushing down. There's a force of gravity acting on it, pushing it down. So here's your load. And your effort is the force that you're using to try to lift the load. So in this case, you're pushing down over here in order to get the load to lift. So this would be your effort force. So let's take a look. What is the thing that's in the middle? The fulcrum. So since the fulcrum is in the middle, if we think of flex, fulcrum is in the middle, that makes this a first class lever. Okay, so let's look at class two levers. So in this case, we have a wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow is full of a bunch of stuff, like a bunch of dirt, let's say. So it's carrying a big weight, and that's what we're trying to carry. So somewhere in the middle of the wheelbarrow will be the center of mass of that weight. So let's say somewhere here, this would be the load pushing down. Okay, so that's the load. Then what about the pivot point? So if you were to lift a wheelbarrow up and down, this would be the pivot point right here. So that would be the fulcrum. Okay, and in order to, let's say, lift this load up and dump all the contents out of it onto the ground, you would have to apply an effort force up here that would cause the whole thing to rotate and dump out. Okay, so what is in the middle here? The middle is the load. The load is in between the effort and the fulcrum. So according to flex, the load is in the middle. So that makes this a second class lever. Okay, moving on to the third example. We have a child holding a fishing rod. So let's think about what are all the components of this lever. So first we have the fish that's attached to the line that's pulling down on the fishing rod. This is the load that the child is trying to carry. So the child is trying to lift this fish out of the water. So this over here would be the load. Okay. Then the child is lifting that fishing rod or that fish that's attached to the line with one of her arms. She's lifting it with this arm right here. 
So that is the force that she's using to lift the fish. So that would be the effort force. And where's the pivot point? Well, she's holding the line down here. This is the pivot point right here. So that would be the fulcrum. So this is the point where the, the rod rotates about. Okay, so this is the fulcrum. So what is it that's in the middle? The effort. So if we look at flex, the effort force is in the middle, making this a third class lever. Okay, so you're gonna have to sort of memorize this so that you know um, how to identify what class of lever um, each one is. All right, so now let's do this again, but this time we're gonna take a look at levers in the body. So when you work out, your muscles are doing their job by pulling on your bones, which function as levers to create movements. In the body, the muscles are supplying the effort force, so the muscles are the things that are um, up supplying the effort to move your bones, which rotate around fulcrums, which are located at the joints. So the fulcrums are the joints, because that's the pivot points, and the muscles are the effort force. The weight that your body has to overcome, either it's the weight of a limb that you're carrying or your whole body, or maybe you're carrying a weight itself like a dumbbell, that would be the load. That's the weight you're trying to carry, okay? So in each of these um, examples, we're gonna identify the load, the effort, and the fulcrum, and then we're gonna name the lever class that is used in each of the following. Okay, so here's the first exercise. We have exercises that require elbow flexion, such as a bicep curl. All right, so let's start off with the um, fulcrum. So the fulcrum would be where the joint is that's moving. So when you're doing an el elbow flexion or a bicep curl, your fulcrum would be right here, right at your elbow. So that's your fulcrum. I'm just gonna write F for fulcrum, okay? The lever arm, would be this over here. The weight that you're carrying is your load. So you're holding a weight in your hand, a dumbbell. So this over here is your load. And the muscle that is lifting that weight, so the muscle is providing the effort force to lift the weight. In this case, it's your bicep, would be this force over here. And that would be the effort. Okay, so if we think of flex, which is it that's in the middle? It's the effort. The effort is in between the fulcrum and the load. So the effort is in the middle. So that makes this a third class lever. All right, let's move on to the second example. Exercises that require elbow extension, like a dumbbell tricep ex extension, or cable tricep pushdowns, or tricep dips, okay? In any case, it's the triceps that are providing the effort. So let's take a look at this example. So we still have an elbow over here. So this here would be our fulcrum. So I'm gonna label it with an F. The load is what we're trying to carry. So there's um, like, so this one over here is a cable triceps push down. So we're pulling on this load. There's actually a load pulling this way. Here's my load. Okay, so there's a force, there's a tension force in that cable and it's pulling away from the person. And now what is the muscle that's actually doing the work here? It's the tricep. And where's the tricep? It's over here. So this would be the effort. Okay, so what is it that's in the middle here? The fulcrum. The fulcrum is in between the effort and the load. So according to flex, the fulcrum is in the middle. So that makes this a first class lever. All right. One more example, exercises that require extending the ankle, such as seated or standing calf raises. Okay, so let's take a look at this now. So in this case, let's look at, um, here's our lever arm. Okay, now where's the pivot point? So when you, ex when you extend your ankle, so let's say you're doing a calf raise, 
then you're rotating, the point of rotation would be right here. So that would be the fulcrum, F. Okay, now what muscle is doing that work? It would be your calf muscle. So that's this right here. So that's that muscle doing the work. So that is your effort. And now where is the weight located that you are lifting? So this is the weight of your body. So as you're lifting your, like doing a calf raise, you're lifting up the weight of your body. And so the weight is gonna be at the center of um, mass here. So they put it in here right at your ankle. It doesn't matter where it starts, just knowing that it's in the center here. So it's going down like this. So this itself is the load. That's the weight that you're trying to carry. Okay, so what is it that's in the middle here? It's the load. It's between the effort and the fulcrum. So I'm gonna write out flex. The load is in the center, so that makes this a second class lever. Okay, so you should be able to identify um, the effort, the load, and the fulcrum, and then identify what class lever it is, whether it's an example um, in the previous slide that was just like the fishing rod or the wheelbarrow, for example, or part of your body or an exercise that you're doing, okay? All right, next we're gonna talk about mechanical advantage. So some levers amplify an input force to provide a greater output force, which is said to provide leverage. So for example, if you're on a seesaw and you're trying to lift somebody that's heavier than you, you're, you can do that by sitting farther away from the pivot point or the fulcrum, just like in that video we watched. So this is how we're able to lift very small or very heavy objects with less force the ratio of the output force to the input force is called the mechanical advantage. Okay, so what's output force and input force? Output is the force that you're trying to carry, so that would be your load. Okay, so output force is the load, and the input force is the force that you're using to try to lift it, so that would be your effort. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. So when you divide output force or load by effort, that's what the mechanical advantage is. That's the definition of mechanical advantage. The load, which is what you're trying to lift, divided by the effort, which is the force you're using to lift it, is the mechanical advantage. Okay? So the ideal mechanical advantage of a lever can also be calculated by dividing the arm length. So if we divide the input arm length by the output arm length, that also gives us the mechanical advantage. So that's here. So what do those mean? The input arm is the distance from the input force or the effort to the fulcrum. And the output arm is the distance from the output force the load to the fulcrum. So it's a little bit confusing here, so I'm just gonna draw a little picture. So for example, let's say here's our seesaw, here's our fulcrum, for example. Here's the load we're trying to carry. Okay, so here's our load. Oops, I wrote E. <laughs> so that should be L for load. This is our fulcrum. And this is us sitting on the seesaw trying to balance out that load. Since that load is heavier than us, we really should be farther away. And I'll put the load closer. Okay, so here's our load. Here's the effort. So the distance from the effort to the fulcrum so from here to here, okay? So that's written out over here. The distance from the input force or the effort to the fulcrum is the input arm. So this is our input arm length. And the distance from the output force or the load to the fulcrum is the output arm length. Okay, so the ideal mechanical advantage um, is also can be found using those two lengths. So if we divide 
input arm length by output arm length that gives us the mechanical advantage. Now we're using, excuse me, we're using the word ideal here because it doesn't take friction into account and in this course we're going to totally neglect friction altogether so we're assuming everything is ideal. Okay, so the farther your applied force is from the fulcrum, the closer the load is from the fulcrum, the easier it is to lift the weight, right? So if your applied force, so your effort force, is far away from the fulcrum and your load, the force that you're trying to lift, if if that is close to the fulcrum, then it's easy to lift the weight. But if you're sitting close to the fulcrum and the effort and the um, load is far from the fulcrum, it will be really hard for you to lift the weight. Okay, so if you're sitting on a seesaw on the opposite side as your friend who's heavier than you, you're going to need to sit farther away from the fulcrum than your friend is in order to balance each other out. Okay, so since both of those two equations that I highlighted um, are equal to mechanical advantage, we can set them equal to one another and say that load over effort is equal to the input arm length over the output arm length. Okay, so we can set them equal to one another. So let's think about what does that mean for different classes of levers. So if we're talking about a type 1 or a class 1 lever, let's draw what that would look like. So in a class 1 lever, that's where the fulcrum is in the middle. We have an effort on one side and a load on the other side, just like a typical seesaw. Okay, so in this case, is the mechanical advantage going to be a number that's bigger than 1 or smaller than 1? Well, it depends on where the effort and the load are relative to the fulcrum. So if they're equally distanced away, then the mechanical advantage, which is equal to the input arm length, which is this distance over here, over the output arm length. So if the input arm length So if the input arm length is equal to the output arm length, then the mechanical advantage will be, so if we look at this formula, mechanical advantage is input arm length over output arm length. If those two values are the same, let's say you and your friend are both three meters from the fulcrum, when you divide three meters by three meters, you just get one. So the mechanical advantage is one. So you're not actually making it easier to lift the other object. What happens if the input arm length is bigger than the output arm length? So let's say the fulcrum is over here. Here's your effort. Here's your load. And this would be your input arm length. And this over here would be your output arm length. Okay, so now in this case, you are sitting farther away from the fulcrum, so your input arm length is bigger than your output arm length. So when you plug them into that formula, mechanical advantage equals input arm length out over output arm length. The top, the numerator, will be bigger than the denominator, so then your mechanical advantage will end up being bigger than one. So if your input arm length is bigger, larger than your output arm length, then your mechanical advantage will be larger, greater than one. Okay, so what happens if your input arm length is less than your output arm length? What will happen? So in that example, the fulcrum is over here, the effort is here, the load is down here, here's my input arm length, here's my output arm length. So my output arm length is bigger than my input arm length. So that means my numerator is smaller than my denominator. So when I divide the two numbers, what's going to happen? My mechanical advantage will be less than one. Okay, so I'm only able to balance out something that's lighter than me in that case. Okay, so let's move on to a type two lever. Type two lever is where the load is in the middle. So let's say we have another example here. The load is in the middle. And then we have 
a fulcrum on one side and we have an effort on the other side. So in order to lift this load, this is like the wheelbarrow example, we would have to lift the handles upwards. So here's my type two lever. Okay, so let's talk about the input arm length and the output arm length in this example. So the input arm length is always the distance from the effort to the fulcrum. So the effort is here to the fulcrum is over here. This is my input arm length. And my output arm length is the distance from my load to my fulcrum. So that would be this distance right here, output arm length. So which one of the two is bigger? The input arm length has to be bigger than the output arm length because the load is in the middle. So in this case, the input arm length is always greater than the output arm length. So therefore, the mechanical advantage is always going to be, so let's look at the formula for mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is input arm length over output arm length. If the top number is bigger and the bottom number is smaller, when we divide the two, we're always going to get a number that is greater than one. Okay, so it's easier to lift a heavy object in every case when we have a class two or a type two lever. Okay, let's move on to a type three lever. A type three lever is where the effort is in the middle. So we have the fulcrum on one end, we have the load on the other end, and now we have the effort. So in order to pull up this load, the effort would be over here, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so let's label our input and output arm lengths. So our input arm length is the distance between the effort and the fulcrum. And our output arm length is the distance between the load and the fulcrum. All right, so in this case, the output arm length is always bigger than the input arm length. The output arm length is always greater than the input arm length. So our mechanical advantage, which is equal to input arm length over output arm length, the top this time is the smaller number, and the bottom, the denominator, is the larger number. So when we divide a small number by a bigger number, our mechanical advantage then would always be less than one. So it's harder to lift an object this way because your effort required will be bigger than the load is that you're lifting. Okay, so it's important to understand um, the different classes of levers, but also understand how to calculate mechanical advantage. You could calculate it in two different ways. One is load over effort, and the other is input arm length over output arm length. Okay, so let's take that and move on to some practice problems. Okay, so we're gonna apply what we just learned. So the arms of a horizontal lever are 0 0.2 meters and one meter long at opposite sides of a fulcrum. Okay, so let's draw what this looks like. Here's my lever and here's my fulcrum. On one side, I have 0 0.2 meters and the other side, which is one meter, I'm just gonna make it look longer so it's obvious that it's a longer side. The shorter arm is loaded with the downward force of 500 newtons at the end. So over here, there's a 500 newton force. What force should be applied at the end of the longer arm to end to balance the load? Okay, so we need to decide which of the two ends has the load and which end has the effort. So the load is the thing that you're trying to carry. So that would be this one over here. That's our load. 
and the effort is the force that you're using to lift that load. So that would be over here. And that's what you're looking for. Okay, so we can go back to the previous slide for the formula and it was load over effort equals input arm length over output arm length. Load over effort equals input arm length over output arm length. So let's identify the input and the output arm length. The input arm length is the distance from the fulcrum to the effort. So that would be this distance over here. This is our input arm length, which is one meter. And our output arm length is the distance from the load to the fulcrum. So that would be our 0 0.2 meters. Okay, so let's substitute the values that we know into that formula. The load is 500 over the effort is what we're looking to find, equals the input arm length, which is 1 meter, over the output arm length, which is 0 0.2 meters. Okay, the meters cancel one another out, so if they weren't the same unit, you need to change the units of one or the other to make sure they're the same so that they do cancel each other out. The units for the 500 is newtons, so we can put that in if we like. So now we're trying to solve for the effort force, so we're going to cross multiply this. E times 1, which is E, is equal to 500 newtons times 0 0.2. 0 0.2 times 500 newtons. So I'm just going to type this up on my calculator. 0 0.2 times 500 and I get 100 newtons. Alright, so since I am five times the distance away from the fulcrum compared to the load, so see I'm one meter away from the fulcrum and the load is 0 0.2 meters away from the fulcrum, so I'm five times the distance away. That means that the effort that's required by me to lift that load is one-fifth the amount. So the load is 500 newtons, I only need to use 100 newtons to lift that load. Okay, so A, 4A asks what force should be applied at the end of the longer arm end to balance the load. So that's what we just did. Part B asks what is the mechanical advantage of the lever. So for mechanical advantage, we have two different formulas and in this case we can use either one, it doesn't matter. So mechanical advantage is equal to load over effort or we could have said mechanical advantage is equal to input arm length over output arm length and it doesn't matter which formula we use, we should get the exact same answer. The load is 500, the effort is 100 newtons and that gives us a mechanical advantage when we divide the two of 5 and when we use the other formula, mechanical advantage equals input arm length. The input arm length was 1 meter divided by the output arm length, which is 0 0.2 meters. And still, when we divide the two, we get 5. So the mechanical advantage is 5. And then part C asks, what class lever is this? So what is it that's in the middle? It's the fulcrum. The fulcrum is in the middle. So because of that, it's a first class lever. All right, so that was question four. Let's move on to question five. A man can push down with a force of 160, well that should say newtons, 160 newtons. He has a six meter long bar. The man is going to use the bar as a lever to lift a stone. The fulcrum is one meter from the stone. How heavy a stone could the man you, uh, lift? Um, could the man lift using the bar as a lever? Okay, so let's draw a picture of this. So we have a lever, and the whole lever is six meters long. So I'll just write that out here. This whole thing is six meters long, from one end right to the other end. 
the fulcrum is one meter from the stone. So here's my fulcrum. And here's my stone. So the stone is what I'm trying to lift. So this would be my load over here. And the distance between the two, which is called the output arm length, is one meter. Okay. So now the man is on the other end over here trying to lift that stone. So this is the man's effort. What about the input arm length here? The distance from the effort to the fulcrum. Well, the distance of the entire bar was six meters and there was one meter between the fulcrum and the load. So this would be five meters here between the effort and the fulcrum. So that's the input arm length. Okay, so the question says that the man can push down with a force of 160 newtons. So that would be the man's effort. He can push down with a force of 160 newtons. And the question is asking, how heavy a stone could the man lift? So this load is the question mark. Okay. So we can use the formula again that we used before, load over effort is equal to input arm length over output arm length. And we can sub in the values that we know. So the load is our unknown, so we'll keep it as just L. Effort is 160 newtons equals input arm length, which is five meters, over output arm length, which is one meter. Notice the meters cancel out. Now we can cross multiply. So load times one is just load equals five times 160 newtons. So five times 160 is 800, 100 newtons. So the man is able to lift a stone that is 800 newtons. Okay, what is the mechanical advantage? The mechanical advantage there's two formulas for it. It's either load over effort or input arm length over output arm length. If you like, you can choose one or the other, or you can even use both, because if you get the same answer both times, you know that you did the question correctly. So mechanical advantage is equal to the load, which is, we found was 800 newtons, over the effort, which is 160 newtons, or we could use mechanical advantage is input arm length, which was five meters over the output arm length, which is one meter. Either way, when we divide the numbers, 800 divided by 160 is five, and also five divided by one is also five. So either way, the answer is that the mechanical advantage is five. All right, so let's move on to question six. This is our final question. Chris and Bill are playing on a seesaw. Chris has a mass of 50 kilograms and he's sitting at a distance of four meters from the fulcrum. Bill's mass is 60 kilograms. Where should Bill, where should Bill sit to balance the seesaw? Okay, so let's draw a picture of what this looks like. We have Chris and Bill on a seesaw. So that means the fulcrum is in the middle. Chris has a mass of 50 kilograms and he's sitting four meters from the seesaw. So let's say this is Chris over here. And the distance from the fulcrum to Chris is four meters. Okay. Bill is trying to balance the seesaw. So he's trying to balance Chris. It doesn't really matter whether we say Bill is um, the force that Bill is applying is the effort or the load, or if the force that Chris is applying is the effort or the load. It doesn't really make a difference. But let's say that Bill is trying to balance out Chris, so that makes Chris have the load. Okay, so the load is the force that Chris is applying when he sits on the seesaw. And now we have Bill. 
Bill is um, 60 kilograms. So if, if Bill is 60 kilograms, should he be closer to the fulcrum compared to Chris, who is 50 kilograms? So Bill is heavier, so who should sit closer to the fulcrum if they want to balance each other out? Well, the heavier person should be sitting closer to the fulcrum. So let's say this is Bill over here, and he's trying to balance out the load that Chris is applying. So this would be Bill's effort force. Okay, so we're trying to find out what this distance is over here. The distance between the load and the fulcrum, that's the output arm length, and the input arm length is what we're looking for. Okay, now we're looking for the effort, I mean, sorry, we know we can calculate the effort and the load, but we don't know what it is yet. We know the masses of each of the objects, but those effort and loads should be forces, and the units for force is newtons. So it shouldn't be in kilograms, it should be in newtons. So if we think of the load, that is the force that Chris is applying when he sits on the seesaw. So what force is that? What force are we talking about? It's the force of gravity of Chris. So Chris is sitting on the seesaw. The seesaw feels it's Chris's force of gravity pushing down. That's what the load is. So how do we find the force of gravity? Fg is just equal to mg, mass of Chris times gravity. So the mass of Chris is 50 kilograms and gravity is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So I can multiply the two, 50 times 9.8, and I get 490 newtons. Okay, so that's really important. The question gives you kilograms, so that's a mass. You wanna change it into a force, okay? Let's go ahead and do the same thing with effort. The effort now is Bill's weight that's sitting on the seesaw. So that would be the force of gravity that Bill applies when he sits on the seesaw. So it's just the force of gravity of Bill. So that would be the force of gravity is just mg. So it's the mass of Bill times gravity. The mass of Bill is 60 kilograms times g, which is 9.80 newtons per kilogram. Now we can multiply those, 60 times 9.8, and we get 588 newtons. So now we can enter in those values. The effort is 588 newtons, and the load is 490 newtons. All right, so the question is asking us to find the input arm length. So we're going to use the formula that we know, load over effort is equal to input arm length over output arm length. And then we'll sub in everything we know. The load is 490 newtons. The effort is 588 newtons equals the input arm length is what we're looking for over the output arm length, which is four meters. The units on the left can cancel each other out, so newtons here, they can cancel. And now we're going to just cross multiply. So we have input arm length times 588, so that would be 588 input arm length is equal to four meters times 490. We can divide both sides by 588 so that we can isolate for input arm length. Five eighty eights cancel one another out. And we're left with input arm length is equal to four times 490 divided by 588, and that would be 3.33, and the unit is meters. So Bill should sit 3.33 meters from the fulcrum.
in order to balance out with Chris. All right, so I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next week.